If you lost a needle in a haystack and then came across it again, it would be pretty surprising. The more hidden something is, the more amazing it is to find. This goes for insights into the past too, including the theory I'm going to talk about here, which I think is pretty darn interesting. Interestingness is subjective, you will say, but I present to you a graph, and of course, if you can draw a graph about something, it's scientific, right? This shows you what you expect to find at different degrees of hiddenness. Here we go then, the axis going along here is how distant something is in the past, and the axis running up here goes from simple conclusions about straightforward practical matters up to proper cultural insights. The colour coding is yellow for something that's possible, but where there is very little reason to think that it actually was the case, through orange to red, which means it's broken through into plausibility, where there are converging lines of reasoning sufficient to suppose that the thing may well have been the case. Now, yellows have their place because they may yet turn orange or red if more comes to light. Having a feel for which yellows are going to turn orange is what we call intuition. But you can't cite your intuition alone as proof. And if it just stays yellow, it's not really of much interest. The stuff over here um, is stuff that happened more recently. Um, that's obviously valuable and important too. We don't just want to know about the really old stuff. But what I would say is that if you want a surefire way to feel amazed, then something that defies what you'd expect to find, um, where you get something more towards the orangey red end of the spectrum up in this top right quadrant, will probably do the job well. In other words, a plausible theory providing proper cultural insight concerning the very ancient past. And that's how I view the thing I'm going to talk about here. It concerns a cave painting in the Lascaux Caves of France. So in terms of age, we're talking somewhere between 15 to 17,000 years ago, back when we were all hunter-gatherers. This period in Europe is known as Magdalenian. Many of the paintings in these caves are in large caverns, such as the spectacular Hall of Bulls. And these could have been viewed by large groups of people at the same time. And these paintings are generally quite straightforward and mainly just show animals. A particular section within the cave complex, known as the well or shaft of the dead man, is very different, however. It could only have been accessed using ropes and by descending a 17-foot shaft, and the space at the bottom would not allow large gatherings. Yet, the lip of the entrance to this shaft is well worn, and together with deposits of bone points, this indicates that people went down there frequently. An intriguing lamp carved out of red sandstone was also found. Actually, the word lamp may be a misnomer. It's very finely crafted, with the oval cup being surprisingly regular, symmetrical and geometric, given that we're talking about somewhere around 17,000 years ago. The cup of this spoon-like artefact was finely polished and quite shallow, making it rather unsuitable to be a lamp for lengthy sojourns in the darkness. So there's an argument that it was actually used for burning aromatic incense for ritualistic purposes, and that, therefore, this space at the bottom of the shaft was a site of initiations or other ritualistic activity. And what these potential initiates saw when they reached the bottom was different to the art of the big chambers. Out of the 6,000 odd pieces of art in the cave complex as a whole, this is the only one featuring a human figure. Was it to him that the incense was offered? It's also quite a curious figure. He has the head of a bird for a start. The image itself would have required explanation as it's mysterious. As well as the bird head, the figure also has bird foot like hands and he's shown standing straight but neither upright nor horizontal but instead hovering at a curious angle. It's because he's not standing upright that some have thought that he's wounded or dead, but there's no sign of a wound. Below him, 
is a spear thrower topped with a bird. It was common for Magdalenian spear throwers to be decorated with an animal on the end, and a spear thrower was found in the Mazdazil cave that has a grouse on the top, looking quite a lot like the one de depicted in the cave here. To the right of the leaning bird man hunter is a bison with a spear sticking into him, and he's wounded with blood or guts or both flowing out of the wound in his stomach. To the left of the man is a woolly rhinoceros. It appears to be displaying aggressive territorial behaviour, for it raises its tail and ejects faecal pellets. Such behaviour is seen in rhinos when they're angered. This may explain the spilling of the guts of the bison. A spear wound on its own would surely not cause such a spilling. I must confess I've seen a video on YouTube of a rhino goring the underside of a buffalo with its horn. Not quite sure how I found my way to that. The rhino won, of course, and the buffalo was left to die of its wounds, but this was not immediate. It may therefore be that the hunter in the story depicted in this cave painting came along and put the animal out of its misery with a well-placed spear strike after it had been left in dire condition due to coming off worst in a duel with the rhino. It seems likely that while groups may have gathered to look at the more straightforward art of the large galleries, this shaft was used in connection with an important myth, a place where a mystery was shared with an initiate. Mary Settergast, in her book Plato Prehistorian, made the intriguing suggestion that the man and the wounded bison may represent the old myth of Yima and the primordial bull. There are widespread myths across the Indo-European continent of a man whose name means twin who sacrificed the first primordial bovine with the world or the animals and plants being created from the blood and other fluids that came out of the sacrificed animal. In various versions, death at first did not exist but it then came into the world and Yima is the first human to die, the first to pass on to the other world preparing the way for those who follow. In some versions there are two twins and one of them dies and passes on while the other is left behind as with the Hindu, Hindu twins Yama and Yami. Setagast saw the rhino as an equivalent to the death-bringing character in some versions of these myths and linked the bird on the staff to the power that was said to fly from Yima in the form of a bird. Setagast's theory seemed to me to be worth considering for two reasons. First, if it was this old, it would explain why it's so widely dispersed. Secondly, it actually works very well as a cave painter's myth. It suddenly makes sense in that context. In Australia, where ochre is used for rock art, there are many different versions in different places of a myth which goes like this. In the time when the landscape was forming, the dreaming, a great ancestral animal became wounded and where its blood fell to the ground, this became deposits of ochre, red or orange clay. Hunters are very tuned to looking for signs of spilled blood on the ground from a fleeing wounded animal, so it's natural they would see red earth like that. Particular clans had strong bonds to particular sites and it was these whose job it was to maintain the connection to the essence of the dreamtime beings by maintaining the rock art, using their blood, the ochre, as the paint. They also decorated their own skin with this, creating a threefold connection or consubstantiality between themselves, their ancestral place, and its dreamtime animal. This animal was their totem, and this type of shamanism is called totemism. Now, the most obvious conceptual model for such people for the creation of a species was the image of the rock artist creating an image of a rock art animal. As such, there would have been a tendency to conceive of creation in these terms, that the first animals were painted into being. Now, if we think of the Indo-European myth, it makes sense. The primordial bull died, but from its blood, red ochre paint, all the animals were painted into being. So in terms of my yellow, orange, red, 
plausibility color coding spectrum, this idea starts to take on a few more orangey tones rather than just being a pure yellow category theory. Maybe the myth of Yima and the primordial bull really was behind this very ancient cave painting. And what comes next is a dovetailing with another theory about a different Lascaux painting. The possibility that the constellations, specifically Taurus and the Pleiades, were represented in the artwork of the Lascaux caves was first suggested by Lutz Antiquera Congregado in her doctoral thesis in 1992. Her idea was that the dots above the shoulder of a bull's head image in these caves depict the Pleiades and that the dots on the bull's face and the neighbouring Hyades. The dots to the left could equally be Orion's belt for they're in the right position. Now this is a lovely idea but at first glance it's quite yellow according to my colour coding for plausibility just because it would make the Taurus constellation 17,000 years old and extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. But it was one of those yellows where I had an intuitive sense that it might turn more orange. So I entertained this while still entertaining the primordial bull theory for that other bull painting. And then these came together in my head as I returned to that curious painting in the shaft. The twin figure is found in Hindu India as Yama, Persia as Yima, in Norse lands as Ymir, and always there are the associations of the primordial bovine. The Indo-European root of this name in all cases means twin, and Gemini, twins, is from this same etymological root. And that's when it came to me. The twins constellation, Gemini, is located immediately to the left of Taurus, the bull, and the Gemini constellation also consists of two long straight lines leaning at a 45 degree angle with respect to the ecliptic, while the majority of the zodiac figures stand upright at culmination. The Birdman also leans at this uh, angle in the painting, of course, and is likewise drawn from two long straight parallel lines. He's certainly the right shape and in the right position and posture relative to the bull to be Gemini. But that wasn't the end of it. The next realisation concerned the rhino. The rhino in this painting, believed by Setagast to represent the death principle in the myth, is in the location of Leo and with some delight I observed that the back parts of the rhino map perfectly onto the formation of this constellation. What came next was more satisfying still. Another instance of a bird on a pole in this same location relative to the constellations, but this time in an image that is explicitly a map of the constellations. First, a bit of background. Just how far the influence of the Magdalenian culture spread from its original Franco-Cantabrian homeland may be guessed at from 2004 research by Dirk Hoige that revealed Egyptian rock art showing bulls in the Franco-Cantabrian style. This rock art is scientifically dated to between 12,000 and 14,000 years ago. This would be late for Magdalenian art and it suggests that a Magdalenian related group had spread down into the warmer climate of North Africa during the onset of the last mini ice age, the Younger Dryas. This would be a logical movement and indeed a general trend of southward movement was common when the weather started getting colder at this time. Now fast forward to the pre-dynastic period of Egypt and we find depictions of leaders of groups of men holding staffs topped with birds on the decorated makeup palettes such as the Nama palette, the Hunter's palette and others. It appears to have been used as a royal standard of some type by this time and is believed to be connected to a mythical group called the Followers of Horus, who were seen as being celestial helpers of Horus in some contexts, but in other contexts they were seen as people who had brought their culture to Egypt long before dynastic times. Their emblem was a hawk. It seems likely then that these traditions referred to the same people depicted on the pre-dynastic makeup palettes. 
They are mentioned in the inscriptions of the Temple of Horus in Edfu and also in the Temple of Dendera, with an inscription in Dendera saying that it was according to plans inscribed upon a goat skin dating from the time of these followers of Horus that the Dendera temple was, temple was rebuilt. Now we're ready to notice that in this very Dendera temple, supposed to have been rebuilt to honour an extremely ancient goat skin parchment from the time of the followers of Horus, there is this bird on a pole, the standard of these followers of Horus, located under the twins of Gemini in the temple zodiac, exactly as there is a bird on a pole under the Yima Gemini in the Lascaux painting. To clarify, this Dendera scene is a deliberate and explicit zodiac filled with nothing but constellation figures. And regarding the main figures, including Gemini and Taurus, there is no doubt or ambiguity whatsoever amongst any scholars about which figures these are. The feet of Yima in the Lascaux image map onto the region of Orion's belt when it's taken as a star map. And this fits with the fact that the Egyptian name for a bright star in Orion's belt actually means Toz star. There's more intriguing support for a connection, for astoundingly, it's said of the deceased pharaoh in the pyramid text, you shall ascend with the head of a hawk and all your members are those of the twins of Atom. This could be a description of the leaning man of Lascaux. He has the head of a bird and his body parts, his members, are made of Gemini, the twins, and he has ascended into the sky, for he is a constellation. Atum is the creator god, so the twins of Atum could indeed be Gemini, and indeed in the later Hermetica texts, Atum is credited with the creation of the zodiac, and in that context there would be no doubt at all about whom the twins of Atom are, the two bright stars of Gemini. So consistent with Yima or Yama being the one who passes on into the afterlife, leading the way for others, the deceased pharaoh's soul ascends into the sky with the head of a bird and with their body made from the twins of Atom, the stars of Gemini. In the Rig Veda of early Hindu India, there are funerary texts that concern the passage of the dead into the other world, the land of Yama, which are strikingly similar to the Egyptian funerary text about the ascension with the bird-headed twins form. Yama and Yami here are the twins, and they are associated with a black buffalo. The texts say, Yama was the first to find the way for us, this pasture that shall not be taken away. Where our ancient fathers passed beyond, there everyone who is born follows, each on his own path. And in the texts, the reader is instructed to read to the dead man, Go forth, go forth upon those ancient paths on which our ancient fathers passed beyond, rejoicing in the sacrificial drink. Unite with the fathers, with Yama, with the rewards of your sacrifices and good deeds in the highest heaven. Leaving behind all imperfections, go back home again, merge with a glorious body. The fathers have prepared a place for him. Yama gives him a resting place adorned by days and waters and nights. I suggest that we consider very seriously that these Hindu texts and the words quoted from the pyramid texts go back to the same Upper Paleolithic origins. I never would have believed such an idea if I hadn't traced through these most unexpected connections. We still see these constellations as twins and a bull, all these thousands of years later. So it's truly extraordinary to think that they derive from the Paleolithic. A later Roman myth that drew on some of the Persian material derived from this root of Indo-European mythology was that of Mithras, 
but it still retains elements that sound appropriate to the hunter-gatherer cave painter culture. Mithras captured the primordial bull and brought it back to his cave where he sacrificed it and from the blood and other bodily fluids the animals and plants were created. And the Mithraeum temples across the Roman world were modelled on this cave. They even had an image of the bull representing the Taurus constellation. This image found on the wall of the Mithraeum is known as the Tauroctony and it contains astrological elements. For example, the scorpion that is biting the bull refers to the fact that the Scorpio constellation appears on the horizon just as Taurus is setting or dying. We also find a raven, who is the Corvus constellation, a lion, which is Leo, a snake, which is Hydra, a mixing bowl, which is Crater, and so on. There are also indications that this mythological matrix extended beyond the Indo-European world. We've already seen the bird on the pole and the hawk-headed twins of Atom figure in Egyptian culture, for example. Then there's the Sandaway people of Tanzania, a people with a click language and very ancient heritage. They have their own creation myth, which has been recorded in many variants. All involve the first people and animals emerging out of a closed womb-like space, whether the inside of a hill, the inside of a hollow baobab tree, or a cave-like rock shelter. In some variants, as recorded by Eric Ten Ra in his essay The Genealogical Method in the Analysis of a Myth and a Structural Model, the progenitors of these first people are the sun and moon, and they're said to be twins, and they are the children of the creator god Mathunda. This theme of the first two people being twins sounds like the Indo-European Yima myths. They stayed together in a hill for a time, and while they were in there, the moon gave birth to children, and when Mathunda opened up the portal in the hill, out came the humans and animals. The first human to be born out of the rock was called Wangu. He married the first human woman to come out of the rock, and they had children. So far, so good, but what comes next is what I find particularly interesting. Some of these variants also make a point of including the sacrifice of a, of a cow during the proceedings for creating the first humans. For example, there is what Eric Ten Ra calls version 6. A thunder lived by a rock. He sacrificed a black cow and then created the first people. And that is why people still sacrifice animals near the opening where the first people came out of the rock. A similar motif is found in version 7. The thunder himself married the moon and they lived together in a home in a large rock and when the moon had given birth to children she slaughtered a black cow and in this way she made rain and the country became beautiful and to this day this is why people still make rain sacrifices. Then Mathunda opened up the rock and out came the children. The rock shelter location where the creation took place is particularly interesting here I think. Though these intriguing versions don't explicitly say the people were painted into being from a paint created from the fat of the sacrificed cow, we know the Sandawe painted rock art on shelters as well as mythologizing such a place as the opening where the first people came out. There is also a ritual that Sandawe carried out, again connected to twins, which involves the use of ochre paint mixed with fat from the stomach of a sacrificed animal to paint human figures. To give uh, a little more detail, briefly, the Sandaway hold an elaborate ritual to propitiate the spirits, particularly those of lightning, to, perfect, to protect the fate of twin babies if they live and of their spirits if they don't. Some of the key features of the ritual are an animal such as a sheep or goat is sacrificed under a particular type of tree, one which they say when struck by lightning splits into two trees which both live just as they hope the two twins will both live. The sacrificed animal is disemboweled with the entrails being taken out and used for ritualistic purposes and the, the animal is then cooked and the best fat from under the stomach is used mixed together with red ochre to make a paint. 
To quote the paper Sandaway Twin Birth Festivals by Eric Ten Ra, the fat used in mixing the paint must be from the sacrificial animal. It demonstrates to the spirit of lightning that a proper sacrifice has been made for it, so that the appeased spirit may accept the life of the sheep instead of that of a twin. Um, a wooden shield is made for each of the two twins, and the shields are decorated with ochre paint with the intention of representing the twins fully grown and healthy to magically bring that state of affairs about. As well as the initial ritual following the birth, further sacrifices are made throughout the life of the twins to ensure their ongoing protection. Another click language speaking people of very ancient stock are the San from Southern Africa, said to be the most direct descendants of the humans that went out of Africa and populated the whole world around 70,000 years ago. They made paint by mixing ochre with animal fat in a ritualistic way to use when painting at rock shelter sites and they had a rock art ritual where a large cow-like antelope called an eland was brought back alive to a rock shelter, killed, its fat taken from the stomach, mixed with blood and other ingredients, with this paint then used to paint on the rock shelter wall and directly onto the participants' bodies, with one of the aims being, again, to gain protection from lightning, just as we saw uh, with this same type of paint being used to protect from lightning for the sand away. There was also a sand myth from one region where the creator god's two sons killed the first eland before it had finished being made, um, but then the new eland and other animals were created using a mixture consisting of the blood and fat of the first eland. In other words, it sounds like the mixture was actually that same paint and that the recreation took the form of their being painted into being. When you put all the San and Sandaway traditions together, you could attempt a recon reconstruction of a very ancient original version and it might go something like this. This won't be 100% right, of course, but I think it's in the spirit of the thing. The first two people were twins and the first animal was a bovine or a cow-like antelope, such as the eland. Death had not yet come into the world, but then it came and one of the twins died, perhaps from a lightning strike from a storm god who took the form of a rhino. The other twin performed a rite both to assist the spirit of the dead twin, helping them to be the first to pass on to the celestial afterlife in the stars, and this same rite also protected the living twin from suffering the same fate. The rite involved capturing the eland and bringing it back to a rock shelter and sacrificing it. Its blood fell to the earth, forming an ochre deposit. This twin took fat from the stomach of the animal and mixed it with the ochre to make a paint. He or she then painted the eland and other beings, other animals, into being on the face of the rock, and they came out of the rock and walked into the world. A rite modelled on this must be continued at rock shelter sites in order to keep the landscape bountiful with adequate rains and abundant herds. It could well be that the scene of the leaning man and the bison in the Lascaux shaft embodied just such a story. After all, we see the animal disemboweled as if to remove the fat from around the stomach. And perhaps this was the underlying myth for the entire cave complex. The idea that this was the place where the animals were painted into being on the rock, and there they were to see, painted there in all their glory. Very ancient cave paintings from the far corners of the world show striking similarities. And this is leading towards the conclusion that those people who went out of Africa 70,000 years ago already possessed this culture and took it with them. There's a nice thought to be derived from this, which is that every human alive today is a descendant of this clan. We are all the people of Oka, so might it be worth touching base with our inner totemic hunter-gatherer rock artist by getting involved in painting some animals on rock surfaces using Oka paint? 
I think that inner totemite part of us would feel quite at home with where the combination of science plus the will to make life work is taking us, i.e. a new kind of totemism. In totemism, we see, we see ourselves as one with the land, connected to nature and the other animals, and life will work just fine if we keep to the plan that emerged long ago in the dream time, a plan that dictates, amongst other things, what we can and can't hunt. Now we call that balanced order of things that emerged in deep time an ecosystem. And likewise, we recognise the importance of knowing what needs to be hunted and what shouldn't be hunted in order for an ecosystem to work. For example, without wolves, the deer on the Scottish Highlands overbreed and eat all the saplings, so trees can't grow and there's a loss of diversity. Conversely, in other forests, the lack of bison and other such animals that formerly thinned out the forests a little, making clearings, also reduces biodiversity. There needs to be hunting in the system, not necessarily by us, but by something. But there are also things which need to be not hunted or not over hunted. We're seeing the need now for real rewilding, both for our psychological health, because those environments make us feel good, and also for the health of the planet. We're entering the age of the ecosystem as we look for ways to live on Earth without being so disruptive to the balance. And in doing this, we'll need to embrace a kind of scientific totemism. As totemists, we passed lightly over the land, marking surfaces but not gouging deep ruts out of them, because we respected the forms and patterns of the landscape as holders of ancestral and dreamtime memory. We believed we had to do certain things or there would be storms or droughts and the bounty of the land would suffer. Now we don't see it so magically, but we know that our actions affect the climate and that climate changes can upset the balance. When we were hunter-gatherers, we were part of the ecosystem. It would be impressive if we could find ways to rewild and support modern population sizes through hunting and gathering, that may not be possible, but we recognise now that we need to find some way to live within ecosystems without disrupting them. The process of entering the age of the ecosystem could be a dispassionate chore, or we could revel in it, because there is an ancient part of us that resonates with this way of living. The natural human that was still living the hunter-gathering life that we evolved to live. When animals live the life they evolved to live, is called enrichment. Living according to a natural plan that emerged in deep time could actually be intrinsically enriching to us because that's the kind of idea we lived by for many thousands of years. So I think it may be time to call forth and embrace our inner totemist. Last summer I gave this a go by doing some ochre rock art using mainly materials from my immediate environment and I can certainly say that I found the whole process very enjoyable. I'll leave you with a little video diary of some of the things I got up to.